Welcome again to class on this windy, blustery day as the north wind moves through the valley. Looking through the window outside, I can see the trees and the bushes seemingly coming alive as the wind blows through the leaves and the branches. Interestingly, as we study today the Holy Spirit, we remember that the word which is translated in English as spirit meant originally in the Greek and the Hebrew also wind or breath. The spirit is that which animates, which makes alive. And as we study the effect of the Holy Spirit on our life today as Christians, we see a physical representation somewhat of the same in the natural world as we see the wind blowing through and making the whole world uh, come alive in ways that it hasn't before. So welcome again to this lesson as we delve into the workings of the Holy Spirit. As we remember from last lesson, after Jesus' ascension to heaven, he sent his Holy Spirit to energize and animate the church. This Holy Spirit is a spirit of power. That is, the Holy Spirit does not only enlighten us, guide us in the truth, and remind us of the teachings of Jesus, but he also gives us the ability to follow them through and live them out in our lives. It is a spirit of, of animation, of uh, ability that enables us to do that which God would have us do. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul talks a lot about the gifts of the Spirit. That is, all people are given various natural gifts. And within the church or the called people of God, we too are given special spiritual gifts to serve our neighbors and to build up the wider body of Christ. Uh, Paul enumerates some of these gifts as some have gifts for administration, some have gifts for healing, others have gifts in teaching, some for caring for others, some people have spiritual gifts of faith, some people speak in many languages, and some people have gifts of discernment and wisdom. There's a wide variety of gifts that the Holy Spirit endows on God's people to enable them to do the ministry that God would have them do, to better love and serve, help, and encourage our neighbors and each other. The Holy Spirit brings these gifts for a purpose, that we might be God's hands and feet in the world. And he not only gives us the abilities to do so, but the blowing of the Holy Spirit into through our lives energizes us at the same time and gives us the strength, the conviction, and the power to do that which God would have us do. In the last article of the Creed, that focusing on Jesus Christ, we learn how we are redeemed and justified by what God has done through Jesus. However, the following work of the Holy Spirit is not to justify us, to make us right with God and forgive us of our sin, but the work of the Holy Spirit is to sanctify us. The Holy Spirit is called holy because he himself is holy, but also because he makes those believers in God holy as well. We continue to live on this world even though we are, we are forgiven and reconciled to God. And now that that has happened, we live a life with God, hearing his word, and being inspired by his spirit. And as we go about our lives with all of these interacting with us as well, we over time also become holy, become more right and good, more like Jesus, and more into the people that God would have us be. This is the process called sanctification. Now, Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, lists some of these fruits of the Spirit. That is, the, the qualities and characteristics that become more evident, that mature and ripen in our lives. And some of these signs or characteristics are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. These are an example of the, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, 
the effects that the workings of the Holy Spirit renders in our lives as we live with God. This is uh, not always an easy process for many Christians. As we grow up spiritually, just as we grow to, grew up physically, in ways that aren't always the most comfortable to us. But trusting in God, hearing and obeying his word, and praying for the Holy Spirit to work among us, we are indeed transformed. And I see this all the time in people's lives as Christians, as they're walking their walk, that they become more, more mature, more mature Christians and uh, are more evidently producing these fruits and others which Paul talks about. This again is sanctification and is the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives individually and in our lives together as a church. In our last lesson, we surveyed the first half of this third article of the Creed discussing the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints, how we are part of a worldwide and history-wide fellowship of believers in Christ that uh, God has called into one for mutual upbuilding and for service to the world. We turn our attention now to the last half of this third article, which begins with the statement, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Now, this is included here in this third article because the third article deals with the workings of the Holy Spirit and also with our formation as people of God. And we confess that as Christians, as we believe in what Christ has done for us, we are forgiven for our moral failings, our mistakes, our sins. While we have still erred, the, the guilt and the punishment has been taken up by Jesus and we have been graciously forgiven by God for the faults that we have. So we as Christians and we as a church are forgiven for Christ's sake, not because of anything that we have done to make things right with God, but wholly because he is good and kind, gracious and forgiving to us. We believe in this very important statement, in the forgiveness of sins. And we likewise in turn, as we live our life led by the Holy Spirit, we strive to likewise be gracious and forgiving towards one another being as Jesus himself, as he was hung on the cross, he asked God to forgive the people who had done him wrong. And we become, as children of God, more like God, forgiving one another, forgiving those who do us wrong, just as Christ and just as God has done for us. This forgiveness of sins is a mark, a very significant evidence of the life as a, as a Christian, both knowing and really trusting, even if we don't entirely feel it, but believing that, yes, we are forgiven, and that also, yes, we as forgiven people learn to forgive and be graciously kind to others as well. The third article continues in the statement, I believe in the resurrection of the body. Now, this is not merely speaking about the resurrection of Jesus which was already discussed in the second article of the Apostles' Creed, that on Jesus' life and his work. Rather, this is discussing the resurrection of our bodies as well, as we are resurrected at the end together with Jesus. The picture of heaven given in the scriptures, both in Jesus' teachings as well as in the letters of Paul and illustrated vividly in the book of Revelation, is that of an actual physical place. The understanding of, of the heaven that is to come is not only of a, of a spiritual a divine existence, but there seems to be a sense that this world which we now know and inhabit will be made entirely new and recreated along the original intent of what God planned for creation. The heavens and the earth will not simply be an abstract bodiless existence, but will have indeed substance and reality to it. Part of that, as indicated in the scriptures, is that our bodies too will be raised, but without the defect, the illness, the sin, and the death that we experience now in this present reality, but will be like Jesus' resurrection, 
uh, in a, a new, powerful spiritual body given to us. In this confession of the resurrection of the body, we believe that we will not only live in the world beyond, but give some hint of, as to our Christian expectation of what that reality will be like. The Apostles' Creed concludes, I believe in the life everlasting. Now, this is a proper ending to the Apostles' Creed as it's also the ending of our Christian life. We confess belief in that which Jesus principally talked about, the kingdom of God, and that there is life eternal lasting beyond this physical life. Now, this eternal life is the orienting principle of our life in this world. That is, we believe that there is a life to come with God eternally. And knowing such, we orient our lives properly towards that direction, living our life along the teachings of Christ, along the will of God, that we may uh, exist in harmony in this world and in preparation for the world to come uh, according to God's wishes. Now, this eternal life also breaks in backwards into our life here in this world. When we, when we do indeed live with God and by the powerful workings of the Holy Spirit, we experience a new, rich, fuller life, a taste of the world to come. This is felt in, in the peace which is given to us uh, in fellowship with God, in the joy rendered in, in worship and in service, in the love that we see genuinely expressed, uh, firstly from God, but then outwards towards our neighbor. These fruits of the Holy Spirit, which we previously discussed, are uh, a hint, a shadow, a foretaste of what we can expect in paradise, in the life eternal to come. And yet, it is a, a real taste. And living with God, we get a sense here on this side of eternity of what will come thereafter. And we, walking with Jesus, are bid to live ever more fully in this present reality, even though trusting that it will not come in fullness until our time comes to an end and we too are raised and living eternally with God. This uh, confession in life eternal not only gives us the principal hope for the future as Christians, but is also the, the guiding belief in our direction as uh, Christians in this world today. The Apostles' Creed concludes with the word with which we often conclude many of our prayers, the word Amen. Amen has no direct English translation, but it is a word of assent or affirmation, meaning yes indeed or let it be so to all the statements that have come heretofore. The Apostles' Creed is a series of statements of the basic beliefs of the Christian faith. And after recitation, it is commonly concluded with the word Amen. That is, yes, indeed, I believe, and yes, let it be so. I hope this Apostles' Creed study has given you some greater understanding about the core beliefs of the Christian faith. While you may yet have questions yourselves uh, about various aspects of it, I would warmly welcome any questions, whether by email or after worship. I would I'd love to uh, help address any misunderstandings or, or further areas of interest that you may have. But hopefully this provides at least a, a good starting point. Uh, naming the basic beliefs of our faith where they are each found in Scripture, and how they all fit together in our life of faith as Christians. We turn our attention at this point now to the third section of our Confirmation program, which is a miscellaneous bag of various topics. We'll be talking about prayer as well as about service. We'll be talking about the sacraments of baptism and uh, communion. We'll also take up some uh, interesting questions about ghosts and UFOs and dinosaurs and, and that sort of thing. And we'll also be taking a journey through history as we learn a little bit about the 
the uh, history of our tradition, that of Lutheranism in particular. So well done in your studies here on the Apostles' Creed. I've been highly impressed with the homework so far and uh, want to encourage you uh, with the Holy Spirit to continue on your studies through this third section, and I hope it'll likewise be as enlightening and hopefully even more interesting as we go. God bless you all in your studies this week. See you again soon. Bye-bye.